Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. If you were hoping to hear about pavement management systems by Abiel Carrillo, you are in the right spot. Um, I want to welcome you to our webinar today and just thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, my name is Hunter Hilburn and I am the uh, Director of Marketing and Business Development for KSA. Uh, on the screen there you'll see Abiel. I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but Abiel, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, I did want to take just a quick second to introduce KSA to you. Um, we, if you don't know, we're a 42-year-old uh, civil engineering firm about Two thirds of our business is uh, comes from municipalities. Uh, you see their water treatment, water and wastewater, uh, streets and roads. About a third of our business comes from the multidiscipline architecture, surveying, uh, and then aviation. Uh, many people don't realize if they're in the municipal market that we also work heavily in one of the larger firms in this region for working with airports, all general aviation airports, regional hubs, and then also some commercially served airports. Uh, but you see the list of services that we provide there, and I'm sure that there's even a few more that we didn't make it on the list. Um, and if you ever have questions about that, we hope that you would reach out to us or visit our website at ksaeng.com. So I'll be able the next slide, please. Um, did want to let you know that we have uh, 10 offices uh, throughout KSA, throughout Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. And you can see the lists of offices there. Um, I am in Longview, Texas, which is our corporate headquarters. Abiel is in McKinney. And with him in McKinney is uh, Bob Fisher, who is also on the line here. And then from our uh, Austin office is Robin Kersey. Now they're muted, but I know if I unmuted them and asked them to, they would give you a very hearty and uh, uh, warm welcome to our webinar. Uh, one more slide. So let me take a second to introduce to you our speaker, our expert, uh, Abiel Carrillo. Abiel, um, let me just say about him, he is one of the most positive people that works at KSA. I love working with him and being engaged with the projects that he works on. Um, I hardly ever hear him say, no, that's not something that we can do almost every time. It's yes, and he always finds a way to yes, and I enjoy that about him. Uh, but why are we, do we consider him an expert? Um, he has previously worked for as an engineering consultant for 11 years uh, with an emphasis on planning, design, construction administration of state and federally funded complete streets and roadway rehab projects. Um, he was the hydrology section principal engineer uh, in the city of Albuquerque's planning department. And he sat on the development review board representing the city engineer and the Albuquerque Metro Arroyo Flood Control Authority. And he is currently a senior project manager for transportation and drainage efforts at KSA, which includes pavement management plans, master planning, roadway and drainage design, and construction administration. Uh, he's worked on several projects, most recently uh, with regard to pavement and drainage assessments or condition studies in the town of St. Paul, the city of Mejia, uh, the city of Alpine, uh, Marfa, Texas, and he currently has an ongoing project in the city of Mount Pleasant, uh, which is a five-year uh, plan for them. So it's with great pleasure that I turn this over to Abiel and I ask him to walk through this webinar with you. Um, if you have any questions uh, that you wanna raise throughout the presentation, you're welcome to use the little chat window uh, through Go to, uh, the GoTo software, raise your hand there and we will make sure that he sees those questions and responds to those. So Abiel, take it away. Thank you, Hunter, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for being with us today, at least virtually. We hope to one day actually be able to meet back in person, uh, but for now, we appreciate uh, you giving up your, your lunch hour to, to join us. Uh, today's presentation is on pavement management systems, like Hunter mentioned. <clears throat> we decided to put this introductory webinar together because we've seen a lot of interest among our clients and figured it was something that a lot of city officials are, are asking about. 
of course, we would uh, we should start with the basic definition of pavement management, which paraphrasing from the 1985 definition from Ashto on the screen refers to the planned allocation of resources to maintain your roadway network. The addition of the word systems, though, covers the tools that exist or that you can develop for the process of deciding how to actually allocate that funding. So we have a, uh, this polling feature uh, that is kind of cool. Um, and so I will give you a few moments to kind of read the screen. You can participate by either texting KSAU 431 to 22333, or you can go to uh, with your web browser to pollev.com slash KSAU 431. And this is a multiple choice question that we have for the group. Um, and the question is, when was the last time your community developed a formal pavement maintenance plan? We uh, we have a couple of these in uh, this presentation. And so for this first one, I'll give a few moments for you to get your smartphone out or uh, pull up the web browser if, if you're uh, kind of sitting at your office. Okay, so, so far the, the answers are uh, hovering um, between recently or never. I'll just give a few more seconds and just know that uh, even after we move on to the next slide, you can still answer. Um, and, um, and if you have any comment on this, um, you can email me as well. Okay, so it seems like uh, for most, at least for, for those that answered, um, it's uh, five years ago or less, which is interesting. So the general idea behind pavement management systems is to categorize the condition of your roads and then make decisions on how to maintain them based on those categories. The most common and widely used method for identifying those categories is called the pavement condition index or PCI. The PCI is a number score that represents the condition of a segment of roadway based on the type, severity, and density of distresses. And distresses are visual manifestations of aging, of, um, of aging or of structural deficiencies. So in other words, cracking, potholing, um, other broken uh, segments that um, that are associated with with um, with a deficiency in the asphalt or concrete. The PCI is uh, is on a 100 point scale officially, where 100 is best and zero is worst. There are seven uh, standard categories which you can see on the left scale, but if you translate it to a simple scale, you essentially have uh, roads that can either be acceptable or good fair and poor condition. It's also possible to customize a scale to fit a particular scoring system that your community is used to using. Um, a lot of communities use one to five or, um, or one to seven to represent each of the seven categories. As you can imagine, the full scale and the seven categories um, used fully is more useful for uh, those larger networks that really need to differentiate and rank a long list of roads. Uh, acceptable roads or roads that are in good condition, as you might expect, are newer roads or recently built roads that are um, that are only having cosmetic issues. Uh, fair roads are those that are starting to show loading failures, and poor roads are ones that no longer have adequate structural strength. So pavements normally deteriorate predictably along an S-shaped curve uh, from good from a good condition to a poor condition over time. And for the purpose of most of my examples today, I'm using a properly designed asphalt road, which you might expect to have about a 20 year life. 
in the absence of any specific improvements, the curve on the screen assumes that the pavement holds up pretty well for the first eight years and then dips into a fair condition and then plunges into the poor category. Now, you may look at the curve and think, well, the road in front of my house started deteriorating at five years, not eight. Or in our city, we designed, uh, we, we require the design to be uh, to, to, to 10 years or 20 years with stabilization. So every road, it's important to mention that every road has a unique curve, but generally you expect them to go through this shape, even if it's stretched out or narrower than this one. Uh, very notably, a well-designed concrete road will of course likely last twice as long, so the S shape is, is stretched out over 40 or 50 years. The S curve is roughly defined by three inflection points where the rate of deterioration uh, is changing. The first one happens pretty quickly and early. Uh, you know, building a new road is similar to buying a new car. You go out, you pick out the make and model that will best serve your, your riders, uh, so basically your family. And the second you drive off the dealership, it's now worth 80% of what you paid for. Uh, the second inflection happens when you dip from a good condition to fair and then from fair to poor. So the PCI is basically an indicator of where your road sits along that curve. Hunter? Hey, I'm back. Um, I did want to let you know that as we are through this presentation, we're gonna give away a door prize at the end. I uh, do need your name. Most of you are registered, I see on the list, but if you're in a group, if you're in a conference room and you have a group of people that are listening, uh, please put your name in the chat window there. And what we'll do, I'll switch my screen here um, to this one. Uh, what we have done is we put all of the names, you see that Avio, into uh, the spinner wheel here. Is that showing? There we go. And uh, if you see your name on the right hand side in this list, you are registered. If you're not, uh, you need to put your name in the chat window. And in a minute, we'll uh, click this wheel and we'll select a winner or two. So if you want to do that, please, uh, please get your name to me so that I know uh, that you that you want to play. So we'll switch it back to RBL here. And you'll have to show your screen, I think, in PowerPoint, RBL. I think you're muted, Abiel. Oh, there we go. There's a little bit of delay there. So the, the PCI was originally developed by the Army Corps for the Department of, the, of Defense and is today standardized by ASTM and generally accepted by all federal agencies that deal with transportation, um, including the Federal Highway Administration, the FHWA, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and others. Although we're focusing on roads today, the PCI method is also widely used to evaluate the pavement networks of airfields and airports. So your taxiways, your uh, runways, um, even uh, roadway um, uh, connections to parking lots, for example, uh, those can all be analyzed with this, with this uh, universal method. So I promise I only have a few slides on the nuts and bolts of computing the PCI. I realize that not everyone joining us is an engineer that doesn't mind going on and on about the calculations, but we do find that it is actually pretty helpful uh, for governing bodies to be at least conceptually familiar with the science uh, behind this method because it really helps to manage expectations. Uh, so first, the first thing that we do in this computation is to go out and measure the type the severity and um, and other uh, measurements of the distresses that we see out in the field on a segment of road. And so we collect those, we uh, document them, and that process is called a pavement inspection. Then for each type of distress, uh, distress density is computed. 
that distress is correlated to a deduction value that basically says this is how much impact these distresses have uh, on what was once a new road. This last step is now done through modeling software, which is what most of us do today. And that results in a PCI score. So another way to say it is that the system is adding up what you can call penalty points for having certain amounts of cracking and distresses and then subtracts it from 100. There are other inputs that can influence the accuracy of the score. Um, we wouldn't have time to get into them today, but there are various sampling methods um, and other specific information that can be fed into the, the modeling software and that can help you hone in on a more uh, accurate result. The list of distresses that are accounted for is very well defined in this methodology, but there are some differences between evaluating concrete and asphalt. Uh, some on the screen, um, so what I have on the screen is, is all the different types of distresses. Um, and you can kind of tell that they're, a lot of them are self-explanatory. Some aren't. Um, but if you're curious about a particular distress, just let me know. I'll have our, our contact information at the end. And I have several examples I can send, including the, the full distress identification manual from the, from the Army Corps. That was a question that we had another time that we made this presentation. And so I figured that it's um, something that it's, you know, people are interested in. The pavement inspections can be accomplished in, in various ways. The decision and cost effectiveness just depends on the size of the network and the full scope of your pavement management plan. I'll speak to this in a few minutes, but you may also want to, for example, capture drainage issues or ADA deficiencies uh, in conjunction with the pavement condition, since you're going to have field personnel um, out on your roadway network. The middle, fo the middle photo is our drone uh, that we have in house getting some aerial design photography. Um, in this uh, situation, it's, uh, we used it for design purposes in Southlake. By using a drone, you can actually process the imagery with add-on software or simply have a technician import the scaled photo and analyze the distress levels. Of course, this works best with drones that capture geo-referenced and high-resolution photos like ours does. Ours does. The uh, picture on the right is a vehicle-mounted camera <clears throat> and processing unit that continuously photographs the roadway with a down-pointing camera while driving. The processing unit has a machine learning software that automatically detects and categorizes the majority of distresses then through a quality control review, a technician can make the minor adjustments you might need to complete the accurate inspection. The, um, we here at KSA partner with a technology company for the use of this equipment, and then we can uh, mount it to our KSA work truck. The, the big benefit of this system is that the field inspection can be done fairly quickly without disruption to, to traffic and without personnel physically on the road. Um, the system works at posted speeds. Um, and so the truck doesn't need to slow down or stop or, or have awkward traffic control in order to accomplish uh, the, the capturing of the data. Um, these next few slides just show a few examples of what roads of different conditions might look like since we're talking about them. Of course, you all know what a new road looks like, uh, but good roads will be uh, brand new, uh, but will also only have minor cosmetic issues that are contained within the surface layers. Fair roads are those that are starting to exhibit some evidence of loading or structural failures, but those failures tend to be contained and are not yet widespread. Um, and they can usually be rehabilitated to restore the strength of the pavement section. Uh, some distresses do need to be contextualized. For example, the photo on the left there is a concrete road that has been overlaid with asphalt. <clears throat> and the joints are reflecting up through the top layer. So the asphalt may exhibit some fair or poor conditions, but having a good quality concrete underlayer uh, means that it may not dip into a poor category for a long time or that the 
poor condition of the asphalt may not directly reflect what's actually happening underneath. On the left, uh, some longitudinal cracking, and on the right, some polished aggregate. Uh, the polished aggregate is something that happens when the structural integrity of the road <clears throat> outlasts the top face of the asphalt. And so you get uh, traffic kind of uh, stripping away the, the top chemical layer of the asphalt, uh, exposing the aggregate to get polished by, by, uh, by repeated traffic. Uh, next is your classic sign of a failed, classic sign of a failed road, uh, which is alligator cracking, named after the back of an alligator. Uh, this is a clear indicator of structural failure, and standing water basically guarantees that a pothole will eventually form. And of course, I'll know what uh, what a series of of potholes look like. Here's another example of contextualizing the distresses. Um, in this photo, although the surface is completely alligator cracked, it seems very uniform and smooth, which may mean that this is a thin overlay over an old continuously reinforced concrete road. And so that's what's keeping this road from develop, kind of deteriorating into uneven potholing or alligator cracking that is more pronounced in certain areas. So back to the life cycle curve, the central idea behind pavement management is to plan improvement projects to catch roads right at the inflection point, just before maintenance is about to become more expensive. So can you actually catch all roads exactly and consistently? Probably not, but the idea is to have that as a goal. A good road is maintained with preventative measures, that can help keep it in good condition. A fair road is improved with rehabilitated work that restores lost strength. And fail roads can only be restored with total reconstructive efforts. I know costs vary, but preventative maintenance is usually about a third of the cost of rehabilitative work, which is about a fifth of the cost of total reconstruction. So take those typical costs on the screen with a grain of salt, but the comparison generally stands true. For simplicity, that means that every preventative dollar spent today saves you three rehabilitative dollars tomorrow, saves you 15 reconstructive dollars in the far future. Now, this does not mean that you can do preventative work forever, of course, but you can strategically plan future to become more manageable and expected. This, um, this next slide is the life cycle over a, a period of 40 years for the traditional worst first, worst first ad hoc way of managing a roadway network. In this scenario, every year, the fund, the road fund goes directly to the bottom of the barrel, trying to pull the worst roads up to a better condition. So basically, most roads are allowed to uh, go through that S shape all the way down to it to failure. This is what council expects. This is what the public expects. And every time you do this, you have a dramatic change on these roads. And by this, I mean a, a total reconstruction. So you have a you have that really strong of a good return on investment of that reconstruct project. However, assuming the city constructs the road at 20 years for 50 bucks, the public will basically see a fair or poor condition facility for 20 out of those 40 years within that timeline. So now let's look at a manager's approach where with six dollars and this is of course a little optimistic but um the the city in this example can shoot to maintain a good and fair condition road for close to those that same 40 years like i mentioned you can continue this forever uh to bring back the car analogy after you drive away from the dealership you can keep up with all the oil changes you know, uh, tire rotations, uh, brake pad replacements, 
and the occasional busted belt. But the fixes over time will keep getting more expensive and they will become more frequent. And eventually you'll get to the point where the engine will reach the number of miles it was designed to last. And then the only way at that point to have a new car again is to basically go out and buy a new car or replace the engine, um, you know, rebuild or replace the engine before anybody in the, in the chat box corrects me there. Uh, keep in mind that the replacement uh, needs to be, you know, at the, at the point that you're actually replacing the road, you're talking about uh, a decade or two later from when it was originally built. And so it's important to uh, redesign that road with today's geotechnical and future conditions in mind. So this is a, uh, you see this next approach, um, which is a, a, what I call a cheap fix approach. Uh, and you see this in communities where you just don't have enough resources to do any significant reconstruction in any given year. And so preventative measures like chip sealing is spread out over many roads every year with that, uh, you know, trying to protect that limited funding that you might have. In my illustration here, there's an assumption that the road was initially built with a design pavement section, but after failure, the city just keeps coming back with surface improvements. Uh, this cycle is very hard to break mainly because your constituents are seeing a lot of roads done every year with very little funding. Unfortunately, and as suggested by the curve, your residents end up seeing a lot of red very often. Uh, this next situation is one that we've seen in older communities where entire sectors of town were built with a huge wave of development. Uh, so basically a lot of hefty roads that were built at once. This curve it looks, illustrates a grouping of concrete roads that will all come due for major repairs or total reconstructions or replacements basically at the same time, setting you up for a huge burden of unfunded liabilities uh, within a very short time span. Without a managed plan and without a steady stream of funding, or some kind of grant that you're expecting in year 40, uh, communities in this situation typically will fall into the cheap fix cycle, uh, doing things like thin overlays over that failed concrete uh, roadway. This is also something to consider in communities that are growing fast, like those in the suburbs of Austin and Dallas um, that are beginning to, that, are, that you can say are, are, are at the beginning of this life cycle where entire master plan communities are coming online uh, as groups of roads. So how do we actually build a PCI model? Well, first we create a pavement inventory, which is a segmented table of the network and an optional base map if you'd like to take advantage of the model's GIS output capabilities, if that's desired. Uh, you then feed the model the pavement inspection reports associated with each road segment. And by the way, the, the modeling software that I keep, I'll keep referring to is called Paver. Um, this is the software that most cities use. It was developed by the core, and today it's maintained and distributed by the University of Colorado. Um, so the immediate result of the software of the model is a snapshot of the pavement condition of your entire network. So basically PCI scores for every road segment. This um, information is then used to develop near-term CIP planning and to identify immediate or at least near-term maintenance priorities. So think three to five year um, lists of, of maintenance activities, like a three to five year plan. As you may know, however, the more information that the model or any model has, the better it becomes at predicting longer term conditions. And so if you have a lot of information about past work activities, <clears throat> exact information about when your roads were built, uh, how much they cost and follow up inspections, then the, then the model can be expanded out farther into the future and assumptions that were made for the first generation model will continue to be replaced with real data points. 
this results in the ability to do even longer CIP planning and fairly accurate maintenance and rehabilitation plans with specific goals in mind. So for example, these goals can be to um, achieve a 20 point increase uh, on the average over 10 years, or to remove the bottom 25 uh, worst roads from the list in a certain period of time and goals like that. <clears throat> the model does have other capabilities that I'll touch on, but these are kind of the, the big picture goals that it can achieve. The other big picture goal that I'm also sort of implying is that the work plan, at least in its raw form, is completely free of politics. The uh, we have had a question uh, sometimes about how many inspections have to be done. So basically how to maintain that model over time. Um, and that really maintain that really de um, depends on your ability to actually complete those updates or continuously have a pavement inspection uh, program. And, and that's tied to the level of sophistication that you might need or want. So for gigantic networks like what the city of Dallas or the city of Houston or TxDOT or a council of governments might have, your model really needs to be able to tell the difference between scores that are really, really close. Because in a given year, you might be deciding to work on five roads out of a network of a thousand segments instead of just deciding between doing Main Street over First Street, for example. And so your model does need to have a science project level of reliability. Um, agencies like that might want to have a continuous uh, inspection program, and most do, if they have a pavement condition uh, management uh, system. A smaller community, though, can do just fine with full inspections every few years. Um, or even phased inspections uh, so that you can complete a full cycle of inspections every five years, for example. Uh, at a minimum, though, you should plan to at least tell the model when you do work on any road so that the model knows that you went from a poor condition to a brand new road so that those life cycles are at least generally fitting in, in the history of your network. Um, and of course, when you build a brand new road, then the model would need to know uh, when that was built so that it can initiate a new life cycle. Um, however, a lot of communities, you know, they might just build a model or not even build a model, but have a consultant uh, come up with PCI scores just to be able to plan for the initial 10 years, just to kind of give it a try, uh, see how the plan works out. And then their networks are often small enough that they get a feel for how to manage them, um, just kind of knowing what the different categories mean and having kind of a, an awareness of the life cycle and the types of improvements that should be done at each stage. They may not need to or want to continue investing in updating a model uh, for a long time. When we have completed first generation models, we do like to make presentations like this to the governing body because phrases like roadway assessment or condition assessment or road study that make it out to RFQs can mean different things to different people. And it can help, it can really help manage expectations to clarify what the PCI means and what it does not mean. Um, and so on this slide, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes <clears throat> um, just discussing some of the misconceptions that we've come across. The first one is that the PCI is some kind of hard calculation that is based on a structural analysis of the road. That's a common question from council members. Um, you know, oftentimes they might think that a that this type of analysis is paired with a geotechnical bore exploration of each and every segment in your entire network. The response to this question or misconception is that the score is a correlation between the distresses you can see and what historically the cause of those distresses is. Another one is that the PCI is somehow directly tied to existing or future traffic loading and traffic counts. 
And so it needs to be, uh, and so the misconception is that it needs to be paired with a lot of traffic counting or traffic projections or, or some kind of transportation model. The way the model, the paver model or any tra um, PCI model captures the significant changes in traffic is by identifying a new inflection point that is deteriorating your road faster than normal. And so it basically makes an, uh, an assumption that something is changing because the road is now deteriorating at a faster or slower pace. The design of the, of the eventual reconstruction or rehabilitation efforts can then be focused on any structural design changes that need to happen because of that new traffic pattern. Um, this is often a question that is associated with major work in a certain part of town, for example, that is redirecting traffic for a long time on local roads. The next one is that a pavement management plan is a replacement for design. No engineer will ever be okay with you handling a pavement management plan to a contractor and just saying, here you go, build this. Um, except for some of the preventative maintenance work like chip sealing or seal coating or fog seals or things like that. There is, there is sometimes a misconception from the public that when you as a city are hiring this effort, you are really hiring an effort to develop construction drawings uh, for every single block of the projects that you're recommending in the plan uh, for the future. And so that's not the case. This is a, a planning level effort. And lastly, that this is a one and done effort. Like I explained in the previous slide, the more this, the model knows about your network, the better it gets at predicting um, uh, recommendations. So, as part of presenting to the governing body, it is good to put this question out there. What are you wanting to get out of this plan? And the answer is that it depends. We've talked about the immediate basic services, but the roadway is of course more than just the driving lanes. And having that discussion in open council or in workshops can really reveal other goals that are wanted or worse expected. Um, I have a sample list of, of, of those side efforts on the screen. But some of the common side goals that, that we run into um, to tie in with this effort are drainage issues, um, sign inventories, striping condition assessments, and, um, and ADA deficiencies for um, future work like transition plans, for example. Uh, this is just a, a quick screenshot of, of the paver interface. Um, it's unfortunately not intuitive at all. It was originally designed back in the 70s or 80s when programming was card-based. And what uh, the developers have done is just kind of build a, built upon that and made improvements to the interface, but the core way of, of, its, of its inner workings is still kind of that non-intuitive way of working. I, I only mention that because there are some uh, products and services that uh, offer software platforms that sit on top of Paver and it makes it easier for uh, city officials to manipulate the data when they don't need to work with the inner workings of the model. Uh, the data, uh, once you have that model, can be exported for different purposes. Uh, this slide, for example, is a view of a publicly available ArcGIS map that we created for a community in West Texas. Uh, one of the things that we found that the public immediately wants to do when they hear that the roadways have been ranked in their community is to zoom in and ask, um, you know, what the roadway condition is at their house, so that they have a, so that they kind of make, they can make comparisons between their perceptions and with other roads in in, in their in their neighborhood. Um, this is a map that we created for another community, and if you squint on the legend, uh, you'll notice that the scores are skewed. This is because about 90% of the roads were actually in really poor condition. So we graded this network on a curve, so to speak, so that the benefit of, or so that the relative comparison uh, between roads became more apparent in, in visual exhibits. Um, as expected, you can export uh, data in, in tabular form to Excel, and we can create things like color-coded tables, uh, infographics, uh, different charts, um, you know, with branding with your, of your community and, and it can be incorporated into other documents. Uh, this is a, an example of a 10-year work plan uh, that we 
that we put together earlier this year. The color coding, just so you know, ties back to a full size map uh, that I don't have a slide for um, that this client asked us to create. And, um, and what it shows is the, the work we recommend that needs to be done each year. Now, this particular client um, has been on a cheap fix cycle for, um, for years and years. And our plan had a goal to phase out of that cycle over the first five years and then introduce preventative maintenance as they brought reconstructed roads online. They have a, uh, a few local contractors that do a lot of chip sealing and they really like it. And so we kept that as the main preventative measure. The gradual phasing also helps manage the public's initial negative reaction um, of seeing less roads being worked on every year. If you go from uh, you know, doing 35 chip seal roads in year 2019 to reconstructing four roads in year 2022, your public may have a, a negative reaction. So uh, knowing that about your community helps um, you know, us as a team to come up with a phased approach that helps the plan become more acceptable. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the life cycle curve within the model. The red lines are the upper and lower confidence boundaries and the tick marks are inspection reports basically falling within that band. So like I mentioned earlier, if you happen to have a, a situation where an inspection report or a series of them are falling outside this band, then that signals to the model that something is changing. And so it starts adjusting itself to, um, to whatever changes it needs to make to the life cycle curve. This uh, next slide is pretty busy, but it's just a view of the work plan and budgeting tools within the model, uh, more specifically for predicting um, and for, for predicting the, the conditions and the, the budgets in the future. Like I mentioned, you can establish activity goals or give the model budget constraints and then, and then ask it to give you a work plan based on those constraints. Uh, Hunter, do you want to tell us who is going to win the door prize? Yes, I do. I'm so excited here. All right, guys, let me see. Change my screen. All right, I'll be up. Can you see that? Does everyone see it? There you go. We add, all right, we added a few names uh, in, in the list here. So it's your last chance, raise your hand. Um, if you want to be entered in here, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and click and we'll see who the winner is. All right, John, looks like you're gonna be the winner. All right, let me write that down. Uh, what do you say, let's do another one. You wanna do that? Sure. Let's give away two. All right, I've removed John for fairness, everyone. And let's see, let's see. Amy, are you gonna hang on there? Oh, oh just barely <laughs> missed. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was holding on for you there, uh, but we will we'll get those out to you guys as soon as possible. And uh, Abiel, there was another question I did add an answer in the uh, chat window that we will be sending out this presentation uh, in, in a PDF form and uh, also the certificates uh, for CEU credit. So anyway, if we see any other questions, I'll let you know. Sounds good. Thank you. So what kind of maintenance and rehabilitation can you or should you plan for? As most of you are probably aware, uh, roadways are built in layers, uh, at least three, sometimes two, and for long range highways, upwards of five or six. But essentially you have your subgrade, a base and your surface layers. Preventative measures keep the surface layers in good condition and prevent moisture from infiltrating into the base layers. Rehabilitative work reaches deeper and restores lost strength by rebuilding top layers or reaching down and fixing localized issues within the base. And reconstructions are needed when the bottom layers have lost their structural strength. The higher you can keep the work that is needed, the less expensive that work is. 
I mentioned the importance of contextualizing the distresses earlier to make sure that you are matching up the fix with the causes of the condition. So I only have a few more slides left, uh, but we created this simple example to kind of tie everything together uh, as far as understanding the benefits of a managed plan. Uh, this simple example uh, simulates the cost of managing a 1500 foot residential road that was built in the year 2010, just to kind of give it a, a whole number. In a worst first approach, you might expect to reconstruct that road once it fails a couple of times. So once it fails at 20 years, and then again at uh, 40 years, so in years 2030, and then in years in the year 2050. The steps are essentially how much you're spending cumulatively over time. So at 2050, you're close to having spent a million dollars taking care of this road. Now compare that with a managed approach with a strong focus on preventative measures. Not only are you spending less, but the average score of that road is maintained higher over those 40 years. A managed approach doesn't guarantee that you'll be able to do this with every single road in your system, of course, but you'll still see some benefit that helps your budget. And I mentioned that because some, what some communities do is they basically test this out on a certain sector of town, and then they start seeing the benefit and then they expand this out to the rest of the community. Uh, like, it, like it says there at the bottom, uh, planning to, to quote unquote catch roads at the PCI inflection points spreads a lower cost over the years uh, while maintaining the, the better average network quality. Now, of course, the condition of the road is not the only factor that goes into what your council deems maintenance and rehabilitative decisions. And so we're very aware of that. You have your available funding and the list of roads that need work, but you may also have utilities, drainage, um, complete street goals, um, the public's expectations of what roads need to be done, and all of these factors are competing for those funds that you have. And so what we found is that incorporating these elements into the plan helps it helps make the, make the plan more actionable. The last thing you want, of course, is a plan with detailed tasks that just sits on the shelf for several years, um, or a plan that your mayor and council just simply do not trust because it maybe conflicts with a campaign commitment that was made to the public. So making the plan personal and customized to your community really does go a long way. Um, it can help us identify things like availability of materials in your county, uh, drainage threats that might derail any significant maintenance work, uh, outdated technical specs that might be needing some reevaluation, areas where you might be over rehabilitating already. So the bottom left photo, for example, is a road that has been overlaid so much that the curb disappeared. Uh, you may also have grants in a future funding year with specific scopes or management costs. And last but not least, the reintroduction of politics. We, you know, just to kind of say it again differently, uh, we all know that a five-year plan, for example, that recommends doing work in a single council district, even if that's what the model says is best for the overall uh, health of your roadway network, will just simply not be followed. So this is just a... So this is just, like I mentioned, a uh, an overview of the... Uh, of the PCI method and some of the basics. Um, we didn't wanna take much more than an hour of your time or actually not more than an hour of your time. And so, um, and so you know, this was just to give you the big picture of, of the process. Uh, where to start? The, the first step is for us to clearly identify what you'd like to get out of the plan. That's 
the first step in any project, in my opinion, but even more so in, in this uh, in this effort, which may be new to many communities. We would put those goals into tasks and then put together a scope of work that gets you from the way you operate today to a structured annualized plan. And so whether that means a, a quick phone call with uh, with myself and um, you know and others from our office or with or doing a, a, a field visit or making a presentation to your your staff or to your council, we are ready and, and able to to help you um, at least explore this option. Um, and lastly, if um, if you are if you did not uh, register um, through the go to webinar process, uh, meaning that you gave us your name and, and contact information um, and would like a continuing ed certificate, uh, just make sure to send me an email uh, sometime after the presentation and we'll make sure to get those certificates out to you. If you did register um, or at least told uh, emailed Hunter or somebody else from our office, um, then we do already have that information and we'll make sure to, to get that out to you. Uh, so with that, I, um, we have a, a couple of minutes left, and so um, I'll field any, any questions or any comments you might have. Like we mentioned, you can either use the questions box or the chat feature, um, or you have the ability to, to raise your hand and, and voice, um, you know, speak out loud. And basically, my, my photo there is, is just a, a parting thought um, to don't overuse chip seal. If you, if I can have one thing um, to be remembered out of this whole presentation, if nothing else is remembered, is it, it's definitely to not overuse chip seal. So with that, that hunter, I'm not sure if there are any any questions. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions uh, from anyone. So I think yeah, that means you must have covered all of the topics that they were interested in. Uh, great job, um, Abiel. Thanks, and of course, um, my my contact information is there. Uh, you can find me in in you know by phone, by email, on our social media. Um, if you have any question after after the meeting, um, please feel free to to give me a call or, or reach out, and I'd be happy to help. All right, we uh, made it under an hour this time. Uh, you guys get a, little, a couple of minutes free. The last time we went over a couple of minutes, so I guess it averaged out to exactly a minute. Uh, one hour for everyone. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.